Lasting for nearly two centuries, the Macedonian dynasty has generally been assessed as the greatest of Byzantium's ruling houses. But what if I told you that during the rule of the Macedonians, there was another dynasty on the throne? A mini-dynasty, if you like. For a quarter century, the empire was guided by one of its many usurpers. Now, usurpation was not a novelty in Constantinople, but he stood apart from all those who came before and after him. His rule would lay the foundations for the future successes of Byzantium, and incidentally inspire some of Byzantium's greatest literary works. As an emperor, his temperament and foresight were truly remarkable, and over the course of his reign, he would truly deserve to be called the Gentle Usurper. In 912, Leo VI died after a reign of 28 years. Known to most by his epithet the Wise, he was perhaps the most learned man ever to sit on the Byzantine throne. He had ruled the empire well, but not without his fair share of troubles. Foremost among these was his problems around succession. By 901, he was 35 years old and had had three wives, none of which had left him a male heir. In 905, his mistress had given birth to a son, Constantine, and in the following year he illegally married her. Fourth marriages were viewed as highly sinful in Eastern Orthodoxy, but after much wrangling, Leo secured a dispensation from the church, and Constantine's legitimacy was secured. After Leo's death, however, the throne passed to his brother, Alexander, who had been nominal co-emperor for the past few decades. Alexander was by all accounts an awful emperor, regularly indulging himself in drink and debauchery, while spurning the responsibilities of governance. He also held a deep resentment of his far more capable brother, and made it his mission to reverse many of Leo's policies. The most disastrous of which was to cancel the tribute Byzantium was paying Bulgaria. This money had ensured peaceful relations between the two states, and now war flared up once again. The ruler of Bulgaria, Simeon, was not duly alarmed, and relished the chance to ravage Byzantine holdings in Europe, especially with such a useless figure on the throne. Fortunately, Alexander's reign was as bad as it was short, and after only a year in power he died, nominating the eight-year-old Constantine as his successor. Eight-year-olds, however, cannot rule alone, so Alexander also appointed a regency council to govern in Constantine's name with Patriarch Nicholas at its head. Controversially, the council did not include Constantine's mother, Empress Zoe. Never before had an empress been denied part in a regency, Nicholas soon packed Zoe off to a monastery, where she would quietly seethe in anger, waiting in the wings for Nicholas to slip up, which he soon would. Mere days into Constantine VII's reign, a coup led by the aristocrat Constantine Ducas nearly cost him his throne. He was let into the capital with a small body of men, and prepared to do away with the child emperor. Ducas could probably count on the support of the army, but his abortive coup was brought to an abrupt end when a member of the Regency Council acted decisively ambushing Ducas with a small force of men and slaughtering his force. As the blood dried in the streets of the capital, suspicion immediately fell upon Patriarch Nicholas. The reason for this was that Leo VI had forced his resignation back in 907, and he was only restored by Alexander out of spite in 912, so the Patriarch's loyalty to Leo's progeny was in doubt. In order to cleanse himself of suspicion, he began a bloody purge of Ducid supporters, alienating many in the capital. Then, to top it all off, a huge army appeared over the horizon. Simeon was at the gates. Simeon was both a skilled warrior and a canny diplomat. Upon seeing the Theodosian walls, the stumbling block of so many armies before him, he realised his chances of taking the city by storm were precisely naught, so he decided to embark upon a far more diplomatic course of action. In order to get a response from Nicholas, he began devastating the Thracian countryside, and soon the Patriarch agreed to meet Simon outside the walls of the city. Another factor in Nicholas's eagerness to reach an agreement with Simeon was to prevent the recently Christianised Bulgaria from moving from Eastern Orthodoxy to Roman Catholicism. A treaty was therefore hammered out in which Constantine VII would be betrothed to Simeon's daughter and the annual tribute would be resumed. There also seemed to be some form of recognition of Simeon's imperial title, but the Byzantines never recognised his title after this, and details are a bit foggy. For Simeon, now the future father-in-law of the Emperor, the peace was a total success. For Nicholas, it would soon prove to be a disaster. The Patriarch's reputation had already been tarnished by his suspicious activity in the Ducas Uprising, the following purges, and his general arrogance, but this humiliating peace treaty was the final straw. Marrying the Emperor to a trouser-wearing barbarian proved to be too much for the snobbish Byzantines, and Zoe was soon recalled from her monastery, entering Constantinople and taking control of the Regency unopposed. Nicholas was allowed to keep his office, but was told in simple terms that if he made any more trouble, he could expect no mercy from Zoe. Zoe, unwilling to see her son marry Simeon's daughter, tore up the treaty. 
so the war rumbled on. He responded by taking Adrianople, but retreated when the Empress sent a large force to drive him off. Fortunately for her, Simeon would not take major action for another few years, instead conducting minor raids into Thrace and Greece. Zoe's reputation was then enhanced by a series of military victories in Italy, Armenia and Cilicia. Spurred on by her success thus far, she prepared to deal Simeon a blow from which he would never recover. The plan was as follows. A Byzantine army led by Leo Phocas would invade Bulgaria from the south, while the Pechenegs were bribed to invade from the north with a Byzantine fleet facilitating their crossing of the Danube. If all went to plan, Simeon would be caught in this pincer movement and crushed. But, as we shall see, hardly anything went to plan. The Byzantine fleet, commanded by High Admiral Romanus Lekapenos, went to transport the Pechenegs across the Danube. But after he arrived, he soon got into a squabble with the Byzantine officer leading the Pechenegs, and relations between the two men fell to such an ebb that Romanus now refused to ferry them across the river. Eventually, the Pechenegs got tired of waiting around and left, while the Byzantine army in the south, now totally isolated, was attacked and annihilated by Simeon at the Battle of Achilus. Romanus Lecapenos returned to the capital with his fleet intact and was immediately sentenced to blinding. Not entirely undeserved considering his conduct, but his friends were eventually able to get him off the hook. The war, meanwhile, only got worse for the Byzantines as Leo Phocas led another army to destruction at the Battle of Catacertae. Zoe's reputation, previously unrivaled, was now in tatters, and her position as regent looked increasingly vulnerable. To shore up her position, she entered into an alliance with Leo Phocas, who quickly became her top advisor. Leo was an established member of the rising Anatolian aristocracy, and brought with him some much needed support, but the alliance also brought its risks. The Anatolian aristocracy was distrusted by the people of Constantinople, and much of the urban aristocracy, so now that one was at the heart of power, dangerous undercurrents began to swirl. One day, Constantine VII's personal tutor sent a letter to Romanus in the Emperor's name, begging him to protect the young Emperor. Not long after, the Empress Regent ordered Romanus to disband his fleet, and sent an official to see that her orders were being obeyed. Romanus duly invited the official aboard, but the second he stepped on the ship, he was arrested. Alarmed by Romanus's insubordination, Zoe sent more officials to get the measure of the situation, but as they approached, they were driven off by a hail of stones. With Romanus in near revolt, Zoe called an emergency meeting, but by now her authority had all but evaporated, and she had no legs to stand on. Constantine was then brought before his mother, where he read out a prepared statement that her regency was over. Her replacement? Well, it was none other than Patriarch Nicholas, he must have felt pretty smug as Zoe was sent off to the palaces, defeated and demoralised, but the Patriarch's triumph proved to be brief. Leo Phocas and Romanus Lecapenos were still at large. Both men were equally ambitious, and the Patriarch fruitlessly attempted to play them off against each other. Then, on the 25th of March, 919, Romanus rocked up with his fleet, entered Constantinople, and declared that he was now running the Empire. Nicholas was deprived of his power, while Zoe was once again sent to a monastery never to return. Now that he was in control of the capital, Romanus took steps to embed his authority. First, he married his daughter Helena to Constantine, and took the title of Basiliopater, literally father of the emperor, and then prepared to deal with Leo Phocas. Leo drew up his forces in Chrysopolis, just across from Constantinople, and proclaimed that he was trying to save Constantine from his grasping father-in-law. Romanus deftly parried Leo's actions by sending secret agents into his camp to spread copies of a letter written by the Emperor, saying that Romanus was acting in the Emperor's complete confidence, and Leo was a traitor and a rebel. This had the desired effect, and many of Leo's followers began to desert, forcing Leo to flee into Bithynia, where he was soon captured and blinded. When Romanus heard of the morbid fate of his enemy, he apparently flew into a rage at the barbaric act. Regardless, it didn't prevent him from dragging the poor Leo from prison and humiliating him as an example a few weeks later. Romanus, the Basiliopater and the most powerful man in the empire, was now firmly in control, but his ambition drove him ever upwards. He wanted the crown, but if he wished to enhance his credibility, he would need to tarnish his son-in-laws. Thus, Romanus promulgated the Thomas Unionis, a church document which laid down the law on multiple marriages. Three was the acceptable limit, but four was sinful. This is important because, as I said before, Leo VI had married four times, and Constantine VII was the product of his fourth marriage. The document also helped to warm relations between Rome and Constantinople, 
as the Pope firmly denounced any fourth marriages. It was not retrospective, so Constantine was not a bastard, but it reminded everyone of the Emperor's dubious lineage, and tarnished his name. It was a document that the 15-year-old Constantine, as Emperor, was forced to sign. Constantine's feelings as he was forced to give himself such an eye-watering slap in the face need not be said, but he made no protest. By now, he was no more than a pawn in Romanus's climb to the top. And that climb was just about to reach its peak, as on the 17th of December, 919, Romanus Lecapenos was crowned Emperor of the Romans. Now that his rise has finally been completed, I should probably fill you in on his life. Although details are sparse, we know that Romanus's father, a peasant by the awesome name of Theophylact the Unbearable, gained service in the Imperial Bodyguard during the reign of Basil I. Nevertheless, Romanus was never very affluent, and apparently didn't receive a particularly good education. Regardless, Romanus did not lack for intelligence or diligence, while simultaneously being gifted with a talent for both persuasion and the dark political arts. Cool and collected, pragmatic and merciful, he would slide into the imperial boots with ease. Sometime around 900, when Romanus was in his early 30s, he was appointed as the strategos of the Samian theme, then as High Admiral in 912, showing that he must have had some talent. Knowing this, his conduct during Zoe's Bulgarian campaign appears incredibly shifty. Could he really get so bent out of shape in an argument with someone, especially if it meant the life or death of the campaign, and nearly resulted in his blinding? Neither stupidity nor inexperience can explain Romanus's actions, so we are left with the possibility that he deliberately sabotaged the expedition in the knowledge that such a catastrophe would seriously damage Empress Zoe's reputation, and that he would be able to pull some strings to save his own skin. It could also be that Romanus or the Byzantine officer with the Pechenegs were bribed by Simeon, but this is just conjecture on my part. That's one emperor down, one to go. Constantine Porphyrogenitos, literally born in the purple, lived a particularly miserable early life. His father died when he was just seven, and for the better part of a decade he was tossed about in the power struggles of the capital. He was forced to watch as his mother was carted off to a convent, while all his friends were slowly stripped away from him, until he was finally left alone, at the mercy of his father-in-law. Mercy which, fortunately for the Porphyrogenitos, was not in short supply. Instead, Constantine turned inwards. At the start of this video, I said that Leo VI was perhaps the wisest man ever to sit on the Byzantine throne. I say perhaps because the only person who could rival that claim was his son, who, in the absence of any real duties, turned himself over to scholarship and in later life would write several treatises on the various aspects of the empire, many of which have survived and can be read today. Despite his early hardships, Constantine would maintain a friendly and easygoing disposition throughout his life. From birth he had been a sickly boy, and Romanus likely thought that he would die of a fever, but as he grew, Constantine became more sturdy and stubbornly clung to life. Interestingly, despite Romanus's vast ambition for supreme power, he never so much as harmed a hair on Constantine's head, when he very much could have done so, leaving the empire with two emperors. Soon, however, that number would more than double. In 921, Romanus elevated his eldest son, Christopher, to the purple, followed by his two younger sons, Stephen and Constantine, in 924, leaving us with five simultaneous emperors, although Romanus was the only one with any real power. Christopher was later proclaimed second only to Romanus, relegating Constantine Porphyrogenitos to third. Romanus's fourth son, Theophylact, would later be promoted to the position of ecumenical patriarch in 933, despite being only 16, thus ensuring Romanus's control over the church. The war with Bulgaria, meanwhile, still raged, and the Byzantines continued to fare just as poorly. Simeon continued raiding Thrace, crushing a Byzantine army not far from Constantinople in 922, and conquering Adrianople in 923. Nevertheless, no matter how much of Thrace he set fire to, he found himself getting no closer to the prize of Constantinople. If Simeon wanted the city, his land forces would not be enough. He would need a navy, and he knew just the place he could find one. In 924, Bulgarian envoys were dispatched to the Fatimid Sultanate with an offer of alliance between the two states against Byzantium. The talks went well, and the Bulgarian envoys were soon joined by some Fatimid ones on their way back to Bulgaria to hammer out the details. But as they sailed across the Mediterranean, they were intercepted and arrested by some Byzantine ships. These unlucky diplomats were then brought to Constantinople, where Romanus, in the most typically Byzantine piece of diplomacy ever witnessed, 
treated the Fatimid envoys with kindness and simply outbid the Bulgarians, offering a far larger sum of gold than Simeon could ever hope to cough up. With peaceful relations between the Fatimids and Byzantium ensured, the Fatimid envoys were sent on their merry way, and when Simeon arrived outside Constantinople and saw that there was no Fatimid fleet, he finally came to the table with Romanus. A pier was constructed across the Golden Horn, and the two rulers met face to face. Romanus seems to have delivered a masterful speech to Simeon, beseeching him to, as a good Christian, end the conflict. We are told that his words moved Simeon to peace, although I think that the tribute Romanus promised to shower him with, and the practical impossibility of taking Constantinople, probably did a better job of tugging at his heartstrings. Simeon was also nearly 60 years old, and may have felt his age getting to him. He left shortly after, and peace reigned between the two states. Simeon assumed the title of Emperor of the Bulgarians and Romans in 925, but whereas in the past such an outrage could have sparked further conflict, Romanus I was far too pragmatic to risk peace over a few titles. As he witheringly remarked, Simeon could call himself the Caliph of Baghdad if he so wished. Simeon died two years later in 927, and was succeeded by his young son, Peter, whose position in the Bulgarian court was far from secure. Therefore, mere months after Simeon's death, an agreement was reached between Byzantium and Peter's regent, George Susabal. Peter would marry Romanus's granddaughter, Irene, and would be paid an annual tribute, which was sneakily disguised as annual payments for Irene's upkeep. Furthermore, Byzantium recognised the autonomous status of Bulgaria's patriarchate and Peter's title as emperor, which was rendered as Basilius in Greek, or, as the Bulgarians called him, Tsar, the Slavicized form of the word Caesar. Finally, mercifully, peace had been restored. Tsar Peter was a far more peaceful figure than his father, and the peace would last for over four decades, bringing prosperity to both states. Now that the European front had calmed down, Romanus could turn to Asia, where he would achieve rapid success and finally began tipping the scales under one of Byzantium's greatest generals, John Kirkuras. A soldier in the spirit of Belisarius, he had the magic and distinctly unbyzantine combination of loyalty and skill. To add to this, the Abbasid Caliphate, previously one of the most powerful nations on earth, now began to fracture and implode. Not one to pass up such a gleaming opportunity, Romanus ordered offensives into Armenia and Syria. The borders in the east had remained fairly stagnant over the past two centuries, but now, in the capable hands of Kirkuas, the front lines of Islam were gradually rolled back. Several castles in the east were stormed in 932, while two years later the Byzantines won a greater prize still, the city of Melitene, seat of semi-independent emirs and a great thorn in the empire's side. Romanus was beset with a few rebellions in Anatolia during the 930s, but he was able to successfully suppress all of them. The Abbasid counter-attack was hamstrung by infighting, which proved to be very fortunate for Byzantium, as in the summer of 941, the empire was blindsided by a bolt from the blue. It was a calm day in Constantinople when suddenly a thousand ships appeared over the horizon. The Rus had returned for this was not the first time that the Norsemen had attempted to take what they called Miklagard, the great city. Eight decades ago, the Rus had tried to conquer Constantinople, only to be driven off and destroyed. But now they were back, and they had come in force. They couldn't have picked a better time for it either. The field army under Kirkuas was still in the east, while the Byzantine navy was caught with its pants down, and unable to act quickly enough to stop the attack. All Romanus could call upon were 15 barely seaworthy ships. These he loaded with Greek fire, the Byzantine secret weapon that could set fire to water, and sent them to face the Rus. This unenviable command was given to a man named Theophanes, who, despite the overwhelming Rus superiority, wasted no time in going on the offensive. Once again, Greek fire came in clutch and Theophanes engulfed many Rus ships in flame, and the attackers fled to Bithynia, where the frustrated Rus set upon the local population savagely, slaughtering men, women and children alike. Now, however, Kirkuas was on his way back from the east, and the hunter became the hunted. The Rus hopped across the sea once again to Thrace, and as summer gave way to autumn, they finally decided to leave for home. But now Theophanes had been reinforced, and used Greek fire to great effect, obliterating the Rus fleet and ending the attack. Nevertheless, the catastrophe didn't deter Igor of Kiev from trying again in 944, but unlike 941, Romanus ended the attack with a mixture of deft diplomacy. 
He signed a treaty with the Ross, which granted them trading privileges and normalised relations between the two people. He signed a treaty with the Ross, which granted them trade privileges and normalised how trade between the two peoples was conducted, which resulted in a warming of relations between the two peoples. He also made a few reforms aimed at reducing the power of the landed aristocracy in Anatolia, but despite his best efforts, he was unable to fully inhibit their power, which would continue to grow for the next century. Kirkuas continued to lead successful expeditions east, and the people of the capital were overjoyed at the victories. But as he grew older, Romanus found fewer reasons for joy. Romanus Lecapenos, the same man who had leapfrogged to the throne with such predatory precision, now began to get cold feet. By 941, he was in his 70s and his mental state had slowly been declining for years. The pervading sense of guilt he felt for usurping Constantine Porphyrogenitos grew with each passing year, and as he aged, he became more concerned with saving his soul for heaven. In addition to this, his eldest son, Christopher, died in 931, leaving him with his two younger sons, Stephen and the other Constantine. Unlike Christopher and Constantine Porphyrogenitos, however, his two younger sons were pretty much useless. That, combined with the guilt he felt at his usurpation, allowed Romanus to have a true light bulb moment. Romanus made a revelation of such remarkable foresight and statesmanship that, had it been made by other rulers throughout the centuries, could have saved much pain and bloodshed. My, my sons, sons suck. suck my... His mercy had prevented him from killing Constantine Porphyrogenitos, and in 944, he began the process of restoring his 39-year-old son-in-law. He drafted a will announcing that he would inherit full power upon Romanus' death. Simply due to his Macedonian heritage, the Porphyrogenitos had gained for himself the love of the people, and they had always hoped for his restoration to full power. Romanus' desire to save his soul also manifested itself in other forms, such as when Romanus ordered the forced conversion of Jews across the empire, then expelling them if they refused. The only outcome of this pointless act was to upset relations with the Jewish Khazar Khaganate across the Black Sea, who had previously been on good terms with the Byzantines. However, this animosity never boiled over to war, due to the geographic disparity of the two states and the fact that Khazar power would be broken forever only 20 years later by Sviatoslav of Kiev. Not everyone was thrilled about the Porphyrogenitos' re-inheritance, however, especially his scheming brothers-in-law, Stephen and Constantine Lakapenos. When the news broke that they had been disinherited, they immediately began scheming against their father. And on the 20th of December 944, they broke into the palaces and captured him. It's a mark of Romanus' decline that he offered no resistance, and gladly went into exile on the prince's islands. Then there were three. The Lekapenos brothers were eager to do away with the Porphyrogenitos, but they were fighting an uphill battle. In the aftermath of Romanus' deposition, the people of Constantinople were more concerned with the safety of Constantine, so the Lekapenids reluctantly confirmed Constantine as senior emperor, and for a while a cold war developed between the two sides. Helena, Constantine's wife and the daughter of Romanus, continually urged her husband to strike against her brothers, but the easygoing and gentle Constantine demurred. The situation finally came to a head in 945, when Constantine got word that the Lekapenos brothers were planning to assassinate him. Finally jolted into action, he moved fast, arresting his co-emperors and exiling them to the monastery where Romanus was staying. Support for the Porphyrogenitos' return had always been high, so the Lekapenos brothers found that they had little support and were unable to fight back. Thus ended the rule of the Lekapenos dynasty. Romanus spent his remaining days in his monastery, but while he no longer had to contend with the business of governance, he could find no peace. He was racked with ominous nightmares, and when his son, Constantine Lekapenos, was killed during an escape attempt in 946, he finally broke. He begged for a full confession, 300 monks assembled to hear the old emperor repent, and they filled a book with a list of his sins as he spoke. Finally, the miserable old man was whipped by a church novice, before finally the book of sins was dispatched to a famous monastery to see if he could be forgiven. The book returned a while later, supposedly empty. Romanus's wish had been fulfilled, and he had been forgiven. He lived out his last days in peace until he finally died on the 15th of June, 948, nearly 80 years old. He was returned to Constantinople and buried in the monastery of Miraleon. When Constantine VII came to full power, he was 40 years old, and had spent 33 of those years under the regency of others. His entire adult life was spent in the shadow of a usurper, 
and, in any other circumstances, he should have died in that shadow. Yet Romanus was a different sort of man. He preferred clemency over cruelty and peace over war. His deft crisis management saw Byzantium safely through its worst war of the 10th century, while leaving it on sound footing for his successors, and opening the way for the more dramatic conquests that followed in the coming decades. The war with Bulgaria had been a de facto Byzantine defeat, but the peace Romanus established lasted for four decades, and, by the time it ended, Byzantium was in a far more powerful position. By the end of his reign, he was a shadow of his former self, but for most of the time he ruled, he had ruled well, and the empire could be grateful for his service. Constantine VII would rule for another 15 years after Romanus' deposition, but that's a story for another time.